Hello and welcome to the Bazooka Season 2, Episode 6. This is Surgery. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at Tarnowski stations in one clinical course. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button. We are well over 1,000 subscribers, so congratulations to each and every one of us for making us to this far on the YouTube channel. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So beginning with our station one, what procedure is this? What are the indications? What are the complications? I will give you two seconds to pause the video if you may. If you haven't yet dropped a like, what are you waiting for? Drop a like. Also tell a friend to tell a friend that it is indeed exam week on the channel and we shall aim to release daily content to prepare you guys for your exams that are coming up very soon. Your OSCE exam stations as well as the theory exams. So please tell a friend to tell a friend. We are also going to be introducing some preclinical topics as well as preclinical questions on the channel. So if you have a friend that is part of the preclinical sciences, please let them know too as we grow the channel to a much, much larger proportions. So here comes the answer. So this is obviously a vena puncture. Um, indications could either be diagnostic where we want to order for blood, uh, obtain blood for some serological investigations such as a full blood count or a complete blood count with a differential count, a retroviral test, hematocrit, even coagulation studies. We may also do this in therapeutic uh, ways like for example in polycythemia where you actually want to reduce the red blood cell content, the white blood cell content because as these people have a very high white blood cell platelet as well as red blood cell uh, content, their blood is very viscous and they run the risk of forming thrombi. Then what are the complications of a vena puncture? You could have hematoma formation in the site, infections with recurrent pricks. You could also have nerve damage, hemoconcentration that is often as a consequence of prolonged tonicate application, syncope that may be due to the site of blood itself. It's usually a psychogenic trigger. Petechiae and bruises can be seen. Excessive bleeding from the, from the area, especially in patients with bleeding disorders. Thrombosis may also happen due to the injury to the vessel in the process of the vena puncture. You may also have arterial puncture where you actually enter into an artery and you may also have iatrogenic anemia with recurrent vena punctures. Moving on to station two, what are the complications of skin suturing? Name the four types of the suture techniques shown in this slide. What is the most appropriate suture material to be used? I will give you two seconds to think through this. And here comes the answer. So obviously, one complication could be that there is compartment syndrome, increased intracompartmental pressure. If you have applied the suture too tight, you could also have wound infection as well as wound dehiscence. You could also have some reactions to suture materials, allergic reactions to suture materials. Then the four suturing techniques, this first one here is known as a simple interrupted suture, or you can call it as an intermittent suture. The second suture here is known as a continuous suture. The third suture is known as a forward interlocking suture, or you can refer to it as a blanket continuous suture. And then of course, the, the fourth one here is a retention suture. Then what is the most appropriate suture to be used? So for the skin, we want to use monofilament, non-absorbable sutures, preferably nylon. We could use 30 or 40 for the trunk, 40 or 50 for the extremities, uh, as well as the scalp, 50060 for the face. Station three, what procedure is being carried out? What is the most likely diagnosis? How would you confirm that the procedure has been correctly done? What alternative procedure can be done to achieve the same goal? I will give you three seconds to think through this question and shout at your screen. If you are enjoying this videos, please drop a comment below it really does encourage me and also helps with the YouTube algorithm and pushing for the channel to get more recognition among most medical students in the country and most medical students in the world. And here comes the answer. So this is obviously MUA, manipulation under anesthesia. Most likely this person has a displaced fracture of either the radius or the ulnar. And how you would confirm this is of course ordering for a check x-ray after you, uh, a post-reduction x-ray, 
so-called, after you reduce uh, the fracture. And of course, an alternative procedure would be uh, an open uh, reduction and internal fixation. And take note that the type of fracture that has to be used with MUA is a closed fracture. You are not going to be performing MUA on an open fracture. With open fractures, you'd rather be taking the open approach, the open reduction and so-called internal fixation. Then station four, what is the diagnosis? List the predisposing factors. What are the symptoms? I will give you two seconds to think through this question. And here is the image on the right of your screen. And here comes the answer. So this is obviously a gastric ulcer. And uh, predisposing factors include things like drugs, corticosteroids, NSAIDs. You could also have alcohol intake, helicobacter pylori infection, smoking, a family history of ulcers, as well as a history of gastritis. Then uh, symptoms include epigastric pain that is often worsened by eating and relieved by hunger, but sometimes you may not have this characteristic fluctuation or the characteristic uh, variation uh, according to the meals. You may also have nausea and vomiting. You may also have melina, which is this dark stool. And this epigastric pain will be this burning sensation that is often there. They may also be features of gastroesophageal reflux, but not in all the cases. Then station five, a patient presents with chronic discharge of pus from a wound near the anus. A probe shows that there is connection into the anal canal. What is the diagnosis? What are the possible causes? What is the treatment? So I will give you three seconds to think through this. And here comes the answer. So this is obviously an anal fistula or fistula in anal. Then the causes could largely be divided into two main groups. Cryptoglandular, which is accounting for about 90% of the cases, and non-cryptoglandular causes, which are accounting for about 10% of the causes. Cryptoglandular means that there's going to be an infection of the intersphincteric glands. Most commonly, it's going to be due to a rupture of an uh, anorectal abscess. And then non-cryptoglandular could be due to other conditions such as Crohn's disease, malignancies, and even trauma. Then the treatment is obviously a fistulotomy where you're going to be opening the fistula. Sometimes you may decide to actually apply a sclerosing agent to completely destroy the tissues that are present in this fistula to prevent it from recurring. They're very common in HIV patients, by the way. Station six, the diagram shows an x-ray. What is the diagnosis? What is the mode of management? What are the complications associated with the mode of management? I will give you two seconds to think through this. You may be screaming at your screen right now. And here comes the answer. But before I actually show you the answer, let's just first have a look at this x-ray and read through this x-ray. So as you can see, this person here has uh, a homogeneous opacity that is affecting the um, right side of the chest and it's showing a meniscus. So this looks like a meniscus here and you have this homogeneous opacity. You have a silhouette sign of the um, right hemidiaphragm as well as the right heart border of the lung. Uh, of the heart rather then you also have loss of visualization of the pulmonary markings in the periphery of the upper zones of the lungs as well as the visualization of the parietal pleura so this, these are the typical findings that you might have seen on this x-ray so obviously this is going to be a right-sided pleural effusion with a right-sided pneumothorax the reason why i do not want to commit and say this is obviously a hemo pneumothorax is because we we are not really so sure of the clinical history of this patient and additionally it's almost impossible to tell whether this is actually this fluid here is actually blood or it's lymphatic or it could even be pus so it's much safer for you to say a right-sided pleural effusion with a right-sided pneumothorax. Then what is the mode of management? Of course, an intercostal chest drainage or intercostal chest tube. Uh, then the complications may either be early, intermediate, or late. Early complications include misplacement of the tube, subcutaneous emphysema, injury to certain organs such as the lungs, the heart, the liver. Virtually almost all the organs in the thoracic cavity aren't safe from an ICD insertion. You could also have contralateral pneumothorax, hemorrhage, and a hemothorax that you may cause. Intermediate complications include re-expansion edema, especially if you drain 
more than 1,500 mils of fluid in one setting in 24 hours or within 24 hours. Then, of course, the tube could be blocked. You could also have infection along the chest tube. Late complications include a retained hemothorax, a pneumothorax after removal of the tube, empyema, as well as fistula formation. Moving on to station 7, specimen of the distal section of the esophagus is shown in the picture. Describe the lesion. What is the most likely diagnosis? What will be the symptoms? I will give you two seconds to write down your answer. And here comes the answer. This is obviously an ulcerative mass or an ulcerative lesion that is affecting the lower portion of the esophagus. This is obviously an esophageal carcinoma. And the symptoms are going to be progressive dysphagia. That's going to start off first with solids, then liquids, and then eventually will be total dysphagia, which at, at one point the patient will not even be able to swallow their own saliva. There may be features of difficulty in swallowing. That's odinophagia. There may be some chest pains, or there may be features of metastasis of the tumor. For example, it may metastasize to the uh, trachea and result in dyspnea. It may metastasize to the recurrent laryngeal nerves and result in hoarseness of the voice. Moving on to station eight, the what procedure is shown in, is the slide showing? What is this procedure for? Which other examination can be conducted to assess for the answer in question number two? I will give you a second to actually think through this because this should be very easy and you should actually have done this on your word. So here comes the answer. So this is obviously fluid thrill and it's done to determine the presence of, a, of a excessive um, peritoneal fluid in the peritoneal space. And this is obviously ascites. Then another examination that we may perform to prove this is you may do shifting downness where you percuss in an area and you discover that this area is dull. Then you keep your finger in that area and you ask the patient to move, to turn to their lateral side and you percuss on that area. And if that area is no longer dull, then you refer to that as shifting downness. It means that the fluid has shifted to another gravity dependent position. Station nine, a patient presents with scrotal mass, which trans illuminates. What is the diagnosis? What is the anatomical pathology? What is the treatment? I will give you three seconds to think through this question. And here comes the answer. So this is obviously a hydrocell. And the anatomical pathology is that you have the serous fluid accumulation that's going to be found between the tunica vaginalis as well as the tunica albuginea. And in the management of the condition, definitive management is obviously surgical interventions. There are two procedures that could be done. The first procedure is known as the Lord's procedure, where you can actually placate the tunica vaginalis. Then the second procedure is the Jaboulet's uh, repair, which is going to be entailing inverting the sac. Then moving on to the last station, what is the diagnosis in the picture shown? Describe the lesions, give two complications. I will give you two seconds to have a look at this picture and say your answer out loud or write it down. Again, if you haven't yet subscribed, please hit the subscribe button. Also, do not forget to hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post, drop a like, drop a comment, share the link to this page to someone who's writing a surgical exam very soon, as well as share the link to the channel so that we gain more subscribers and gain more recognition in the country. If this channel actually really blows up and becomes the biggest channel in the country, you will make my century. Not even my year, but you will definitely make my century. So here comes the answer. This is obviously stage four breast, breast cancer. The reason why you say that this is stage four breast cancer is that you only get ulceration of the mass in a stage four breast cancer. Then this is obviously an ulcerated mass that's found in the upper outer quadrant of the uh, breast with some necrotic tissue that can be visualized. And two complications could be one phantom breast pain as well as distant metastasis. Thank you for spending your time to listen to this episode of The Bazooka. If you did enjoy this, drop a comment below as you are waiting on. And as we carry on to our new target of 2,000 subscribers, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu to Zambia and...